go to this thing. All right, so what I was going to start with, like, um, build this stuff we didn't quite finish last time, and then just continue on. We're talking about how stuff dissolves in water. And so last time we, we talked about this already, right, that um, they're out of charge, the stuff on the other side is more soluble than the stuff in the center. And a lot of that has to do with because of how things interact with oxygen, the ions they make. And um, there's other ways to make the stuff in the center of the chart, chart soluble. And that is to use a different Lewis base than oxygen, right? So Lewis base would be Y, right? If you remember the example, I was giving X was a metal and we put some oxygen around it. So oxygen is something that can donate electrons, but there's other things in solution that can also donate electrons and help stuff dissolve, especially this very soluble stuff in the middle of the chart. One of the things that's really good at it is um, dissolved organic substance. And they, they chelate metals. And so, for instance, they make all these elements are really important biologically for uh, organisms, especially aquatic organisms. Having organic substances in the water helps dissolve all that stuff in the middle of the chart, chart that wouldn't otherwise be all that soluble. And so, um, we're going to talk in some detail later about what dissolved organic substances are like, the different categories of them. There's a general category of natural organic substances called the humic substances, which are divided up into different categories on the basis of how soluble they are or aren't in water. So I want to show you, this is a, a picture of a molecule that's called a fulvic acid. Um, it's a type of organic chemical that biologically produced that, that is very soluble in water. And the reason is that all of these things are called COOH. You have one, two, three, four, uh, five of them, right? Those are just like the acetic acid thing that I was uh, talking to you about last time. And let's just make sure we're still on full screen over here. Um, yes, we are. Um, and that acetic acid, if you recall, can ionize in solution and lose its hydrogen and then become a negatively charged thing, which is really good at binding metal. So this one molecule has five of those things on it, which means it's pretty good at binding metal. So we'll see um, that a dissolved organic carbon, which we often think of abbreviated DOC, you'll see that term a lot, DOC, this stands for dissolved organic carbon. Sometimes we'll see POC, particular organic carbon. When that stuff's in the environment, it helps to solubilize the stuff in the chart that needs a little bit of help to stay in the water, and that's the stuff in the center. Okay, so there's a third thing which we haven't yet talked about, which we'll do, we're going to talk about in more detail later. But you know, in nature, there's particles all over the place, and the particles have active surfaces. And the active surfaces also have acid base chemicals. So clay minerals, for instance, have OH uh, part of the molecule, and that OH can either lose a hydrogen ion, like an acid, and make a negatively charged particle, or it can gain a hydrogen ion, acting like a base, and it can get a positive charge. That makes our, pot, our particle to be negative or positively charged. And they can attract things from solution to their surfaces, right? or even things that weren't necessarily all that easy to dissolve. All of a sudden, they don't care if the oxygen they're binding to is part of something that's dissolved, or it's part of something that's particular, they just go there and find those extra electrons. And so we will find that suspended particles can also affect the solution equilibrium of pretty much all the elements in the chart because of this kind of interaction. And like I said, we're gonna have a whole week where we talk about this stuff in detail. But I just want you to be aware of the fact that whether or not a chemical is truly dissolved, part of the particulates are part of the very, very fine particulates that we have in a lot of environments, which are called colloids, uh, that this kind of Lewis acid, Lewis base chemistry happens, and it affects what dissolves, what transports where in rivers and in um, uh, groundwater settings, etc. 
So that was kind of the stuff that I didn't quite get to that, that side of those. And so these were, this is a slide I showed you last time that we kind of talked about this. So today, we want to talk a little bit more, just continuing on on this discussion about complexes, what we really mean and what, what the story there. And then we'll talk more about other aspects of solubility, how we define it, um, what are total dissolved solids, and even some mineral solubility diagrams. Okay, so we've talked about this before, but I just want to remind you again formally what a complex is. Complex is a Lewis acid, Lewis phase interaction that occurs when there are it's primarily in aqueous solution, or you can find them in other cases too, but where we have associations that are weaker than a true chemical bond between solutes that form organized structures. And it almost always takes the form of a Lewis acid, which is something that is electron deficient, but possibly charged metal ion at the center of a group of Lewis bases that are donating some electrons to help stabilize the Lewis acid. And the Lewis bases, in the case of complexes, are called ligands. We talked about that a little bit in the first week. This is just to remind you what ligands are. Ligands are things, chemicals, they're just Lewis bases that can donate electrons to help stabilize something that's electron deficient in Lewis acid in solution. Ligands come in a whole variety of chemical forms. And we don't, this slide doesn't define the different chemical forms, but it defines how many places on a ligand yeah. it binds with metals. Okay. And many ligands are, are monodensity. They take many teeth. Uh, they can bite onto a molecule in one place. That's where the name comes from. Something like ammonia um, or hydroxide ions or chloride ions. A bidentate ligand has two things. And I give you an example of a molecule called ethylene diamine uh, before, which is two nitrogens connected by two carbons. And the point being that one molecule can donate two electrons. And when we have that happening, then we can make um, what's called uh, spe a special kind of complex called a key link, right? So the only difference between a key link and a complex is that complexes can have. Um, it's a broader term, you know, monodentate or bidentate or tridentate ligand. But to officially be called a uh, complex, you have to have a polydentate ligand. And chelates are important in a lot of different things. You know, I think as I mentioned previously, when you see chelated metals, um, if you're taking supplements or whatever, it's basically a way of making things more bioavailable, they being more water soluble and easier to process. Um, inside your body. And um, chelates are kind of an interesting aspect in the environment. We have all this dissolved organic carbon. We have other natural substances. We can also chelate things. We can find situations where the concentration of these Lewis base molecules are so high, like think about wastewater, for instance, sewage water, um, that it can leach metals out of the subsurface. It can leach metals out of solids. Uh, like pipes or even soil. And so, you know, even though increasing the concentration of biologically significant heavy metals like iron and nickel and cobalt and copper and so forth are, are important, you can also, nature can overdo it, or humans that perturb nature can even overdo it more by changing the relative proportion of these Lewis bases that are in solution. Because um, if they're present, they're going to try to solubilize more and more um, metals. And as I mentioned before, these human substances, there's the category of natural organic matter that is really good at healing stuff. So I just want to spend a couple of seconds to, to explain why, why are chelates so energetically favorable um, for solubilizing things. And the simplest way to explain it is to just look at the bonding interaction for a second. So I have um, an example here of the difference between a metal, Lewis acid, bonded to two Lewis bases, the two nitrogen, and these are two ammonia molecules. And over here, we've got a metal 
And it's connected to this chemical called ethylene diamond, which to all intents and purposes is basically like two ammonia molecules, but connected by two carbons, right? So it's just like putting a string between those two nitrogen. But so from a bonding perspective, the enthalpy of this bond is roughly the same. Metal to nitrogen and metal to nitrogen, it's, it's pretty close to the same. The difference is, is that in this case here, we have three things coming together to make this molecule. And in this case, we only have two things coming together to make this molecule. Remember how we talked about entropy as being one of the two driving forces for equilibrium. In an entropy sense, this is kind of favored because it, it allows more disorder in, in the environment, or this one requires more order because it requires three things to come together. So because of that, even though the entropy, I mean, the enthalpy of formation of both of these complexes is almost exactly the same, the entropy of formation is different. And so the Gibbs free energy is different and this ends up being created. So much so that when we get to, um, you know, multi-dentate ligands that have more than two things on it, the um, driving force to make a complex becomes very, very high. And so we can stabilize things in solution, the metal, because of this effect. So this basically just explains what I just said, the difference between you know, bringing two things together or three things together and boiling down to the Gibbs free energy difference between those two things to just the T delta S term, right? Remember Gibbs free energy, the delta H minus T delta F. If the delta H is the same for these two things, then we can just set that to zero. We can say the delta G difference between these two things is just a T delta S, right? I mean, these are these are numbers you could look up in a book. I haven't bothered to look them up, but there will be a difference because there's you know different numbers of molecules involved in making that merger. So this is another example of a complex, okay? And now this is a single metal. This is a more realistic view of a metal. And it's octahedrally coordinated, right? So that's a very common coordination in water. And octahedral coordination means that the things around the metal are at the corners of an octahedron. And there are six corners. Even though it's called an octahedron, it's got eight sides, there's only six corners to it. It's like two square pyramids stuck together. And so in this little depiction that you can see here, this little um, trapezoid thingy is meant to be like a flat plane coming in and out of the board for you. And the chlorine sticking up and down are above and below the molecule. So it's kind of meant to be a 3D representation. You can picture this kind of like coming out at you. So we can look at the change in entropy associated with having two ammonias amongst the six things around here. And replacing those two ammonias with the ethylene diamine and then having two ammonias. And you can count up the number of molecules. So it's basically three molecules here and um, two molecules here. So from an entropy perspective, the change in entropy is positive, which the minus C delta S term is going to be negative, which gives us a negative delta G. Negative delta Gs have positive equilibrium constants. This delta G equals minus RT natural log of K. And so when K is positive, that equilibrium happens, right? So we're not talking about the magnitude here. I don't know how big the number is, but it's the energetic reason why like chelates are Yeah. Oh, what is M? M is just like any generic metal. It could be iron, it could be copper. Yeah. Okay, so that's just chelates in a nutshell. So the rest of the time table is going to talk about. Um, other aspects of solubility. And this should say non instead of no. Um, but uh, so we're going to talk about the difference between what we call conservative and non conservative ions, total dissolved solids, solubility, and soluble deep time. So whenever I discuss this subject, you know, people are like, uh, conservative, it has nothing to do with like your political considerations or anything like that, or even the way we traditionally think about conservative. Um, as a word, meaning kind of traditional or whatever. In this case, conservative <clears throat> is applied to the word conserve, meaning keep something the same. Preserve is another way of thinking of it. And so there are some chemicals that are so soluble in the water, right? That they get in the water and they pretty much stay there. And how much is present 
depends on the concentrations in the source they came from, but they pretty much never reach saturation in water because they're so soluble that they don't come out, which means that the relative proportions of these ions to each other don't really change. And the best example of that are the salts in seawater, the major salts, the sodium, the chlorine, the magnesium, the sulfate. They're conservative because regardless of where we look in the oceans, the ratios of them to each other don't uh, change and especially are not affected by these three important parameters here, pH, which is how acid or base is solutions, temperature, and pressure. <clears throat> so some things change their solubility only because of pressure. Or only because of acid base chemistry, only because of temperature. Doesn't matter why, if they do that, then they're called non conservative Right? Whereas the conservative ions, they, they dissolve in, in, and stay in solution until, I mean, you can make them come out, but you got to do some extreme, uh, you know, action on it. Like, for instance, seawater, if you evaporate it all the way down, the sodium chloride will come out. But you got to evaporate it a lot. And so that's all we mean when we talk about conservative and non-conservative ions. We'll use this concept a fair bit. And if you take a step back and sort of say, well, what does that mean chemically? It means chemicals that are conservative are so soluble that subtle changes in the things that affect um, solution chemistry don't really affect them. They're kind of a special category. They're back extra stable in water. And non-conservatives are, are more like just typical elements that they have the conditions that they like to go in the water, the conditions that they don't, and they vary typically as a function of these three parameters. Okay, so <clears throat> the conservative ions are typically kind of very non-reactive in water. They are stable over time. They have a long residence time. I don't think we've officially defined this term yet, but the residence time is a mean life of a chemical in a reservoir. We've talked about reservoirs before. Um, we'll, but we'll define this uh, coming up in an upcoming week. A long residence time means that a chemical has a likelihood of spending a long time in that environment, and a low residence time means it has um, a high probability that it will spend a little bit of time. And it can be low residence time for all sorts of reasons, biological activity, uh, solubility, other kinds of reactivity, et cetera. And then the non-conservative ions are the ones that are sensitive to either biological changes, chemical changes, they're variable over time, and they have these short residence times. And this is a working definition. It's not really a binary, right? You have some elements that have very long residence times, like chloride iron has the longest residence time in seawater. It's over 100 million years. You think about that. It's like every time water washes into the sea and it's been carrying a little bit of chloride iron, there's a pretty good chance that that ion is going to stay there in the water for a hundred million years, right? You know, there's always chlorine coming and going, especially back up into the atmosphere and sea spray. But on, on average, it's got that long of a residence time. You think of a short residence time, you can have things with residence times of, you know, less than a day. But even things with residence times of decades or centuries is, are still considered very short on a geological process time scale. So really, we're talking about elements that don't have much acid-base chemistry, that um, are typically on those two sides of the chart, so over here and the over here, as we talked about. And this is just some of the common examples. These are the major ions of seawater, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, sulfate. And I've added nitrate in here. So in a purely inorganic chemical sense, when there's no biological activity, Nitrate is very soluble in water because it's the conjugate base of a strong acid, nitric acid. Just like sulfate is the conjugate base of another strong acid, right? And strong acids like to associate. The difference is that nitrate is a nutrient, right? So in the text, King White includes nitrate in the conservative ions, but most of us in the environmental sciences would consider nitrate not to be conservative because it's an important nutrient element for life. And so when we have organisms around, it becomes non-conservative. That's why I've colored it slightly differently than red. <clears throat> but all these other elements, and these, these elements are also involved in life, but not, not nearly as much. Very, very small by relative proportion. <clears throat> so that biological interactions don't change the sodium-potassium ratio in seawater, for instance, it doesn't happen. 
Calcium is another kind of special case because if you have enough biological activity fueled by enough nutrients, to have organisms that are making calcium carbonate shells, then we can start to change calcium a little bit. But to a first order, these are the conservative on us. And there's other ones that I haven't listed everything. You know, just think of all the things in the same category for them. So it's not rubidium and cesium, strontium, they're also. Now, these are the typical, the major non conservative ions. And there's a couple things that you'll notice about them. So we get carbonate, which is carbonate bicarbonate, right? From the aqueous CO2 system. We got boric acid. Remember, we talked about alkalinity last time, and I said this was the main contributor to alkalinity in natural water. The next most important thing is this guy. Right, so borons over here in the start, start right above aluminum. And then we have titanium sulfide. This is only present in environments where we have reduced sulfur. And we'll talk about that coming up next week. Um, and then ammonium, which is ammonia that is taking hydrogen ion from solution. So we call it ammonium, it's NH4. So, um, and then there's some other stuff here. Like all phosphoric acid is conjugate bases like H2PO4 minus and HPO4 2 minus and PO4 3 minus, including three hydrogens. And then all of the organic acids that we were just talking about, because they lose hydrogen ions. All of these things change their concentration as a function of pH. It's pretty easy, right? We talked about germ last time. We take a solution with these two things and you add a bunch of hydrogen ions, a bunch of acids, then now this stuff's going to change. That makes them not. You can also find the solubility of minerals like calcium carbonate depend a lot on pressure as you go down through the ocean. So again, this is going to change. And so that's what makes it, it you know, um, not concerned. The other thing you might look at and go, wow, look, almost all these things are minus charge. What the one positive person, but almost all these things are minus charge. And if you go back over here, you'll see the bulk of these are positively charged. And no one's ever really explained why that is chemically, but that is an observation that people have found that the ionic load in water, natural water, the ionic strength of conservative ions is carried mostly by positively charged ion cation, and the um, non conservative by anions, primarily. Okay. So, this is just a chart showing you all the ions in seawater, the ones we were just talking about. And the point is, is that all these things here with the five, right? Chloride, sodium, sul uh, yeah, sulfate, magnesium, calcium, potassium are over here. And then minor constituents are, you know, about a, a 0.7 of a percent of everything else. All of these things that are listed on this chart are over here in this category of conservative ions. So there's no, that's not a coincidence. That's why they're high. That's why they go up. And so now what we're going to talk about next is the effect of that on water. So if you look at this, this is chart is useful because it's by proportion, right? So this is the proportion of salt. But in typical seawater, right, which in this particular example, they're using 3.5% salt per liter of water. I've always learned it's closer to 3.4, but anyway, that doesn't matter. That's semantics. I um, mean, it is changing with global warming slightly. But if you go out and look in the ocean, take a teaspoon of water from here and dry it down, what you would find is something a little bit less than a gram of, um, of salt, you know, liter, or, um, you know, a little bit less than. Um, you know, whatever this is, this is, a, this is a mass of the total liter of solution. So, to make a liter of seawater that weighs a kilogram, you're going to put 965 grams of um, water and 35 grams of salt. And this salt in the seawater, in this simple example anyway, is what we call the TDS or the total salt. Right? And so, the way you can think about TDS is you just say, if I got some water, and I filter out the sediment, right? So we don't want to think about the non dissolved solids. I'm going to filter them out. And then we have all the stuff that's dissolved, and then we evaporate all the water. That is what TDS is. And that's a very common term. You see it uh, all the time because it contributes to various features of the water. Okay. So TDS is the dry weight of all solutes 
the only solution per liter of kilogram of food. So, you know, recall that I was just talking about in the last topic that we have things that can help solubilize some elements and bring them into the TDS from perhaps the particulate load. But uh, there are some subtle distinctions here at the edges. Like, let's say we have some ions that are sparingly soluble from the center of the chart that are stuck onto a particle surface because that particle surface has some chemical attributes to it that allow the metal to solubilize on it. We don't call that part of the TDS because it's connected to a particle. And if we were to filter the water, those would come out. So those things are not. The things that are solubilized on chelates, where the chelates themselves are dissolved, we would call them part of the total solvent. So a similar way to think about TDS, we just say, what is low or pretty close to pure solvent, or in most cases, where it's applied pure water? Not exactly, but close. It means a very small amount of salt present. Okay? Whereas when we get to high TDS, it just means there's a lot of stuff in the water. The high can mean all sorts of stuff. It can be, you know, uh, all sorts of values. But is it useful to think about seawater, right, with 3.5% salts in a liter? That's salty, right? If you drink that stuff, you totally notice it. That's not that high for a natural solution. It's, it's not low, but it can get a lot higher than that. And it can get a lot lower than that. So this is that distinction I was mentioning to you. I say pure seawater has um, an average across the whole world, 3.4%, not 3.5. But, but you, know, you can substitute in 35 here if you wanted to. It, it doesn't really matter other than to say that the CDS is the amount of salt that's in there. And solubility is a term that defines how easy a chemical finds it to um, dissolve in water, right? And so the specifics of what is in the TDS, right, depends on the source of chemicals and their solubility. Seawater has a typical <clears throat> proportion of salt, so TDS, that is different than we would find in an inland sea, like the Dead Sea or something like that, Caspian Sea. They're similar. We tend to find the same elements, mostly making up the bulk of the elements, but they're different because the sources are different. So one important thing about TDS is that it um, affects usability of water by humans. Um, because as you can imagine, you're not going to drink salt water. Right? You're not going to drink seawater um, or something that's even saltier, even something that's significantly less salty than seawater, like even 10 times salty. Uh, salty seawater is too salty for us. And so uh, from a water supply perspective, whether it's for drinking water or industrial water or boilers or anything like that, TDS is this really important water quality parameter that you often see people talk about. So what's in TDS, right, totally depends on the individual particular environment. So you just think about water evaporating and precipitating all the time. That just changes the absolute concentration of salts in a solution, but that affects the TDS. And if we look at surface oceans around the world, we can actually see some places are saltier than others because they're places that have more evaporation and less precipitation. We can go to places that are very rainy and we find the opposite. The water that's a little bit less salty than the meat. We can also have for natural waters, especially on the continents, the process of weathering, breaking down of minerals, exchanging chemicals with the food flowing water by different kinds of chemical reactions, dissolving things, precipitating, precipitate minerals, incongruent reactions, which we'll talk about coming up next, um, which are things like leaching and ion exchange. All these things can affect the TDS, and especially the non conservative ions. Temperature can affect the TDS because of non conservative ions. The acidity, the amount of gas that we have dissolved in the water, think about CO2 and CO2 is an acid, and how much CO2 do we plant in the water, and affect the solubility of other stuff, and biological activity. So all these things affect the TDS. And when we say TDS, we're not defining any of these particulars. We may have to go in and look at the water in that environment and say, well, which ones of these things are all of these things operating? But that's at next level up. TDS itself is just the bulk of what's in the water. So there's a table showing you the definitions of four categories of water on the basis of TDS. So these are the official formal definitions. We call water fresh. 
if it's got less than 1,000 milligrams per liter or one gram per liter, right? This would totally taste salty, right? That's three, it's, it's uh, roughly one third as salty as seawater. But if we're talking about out in nature, you're going around and you go to a stream or something like that, if it has less than a thousand, we call it fresh, even though it's not fresh enough for us to drink. If it's got between uh, 1,000 and 10,000, then uh, we call it um, brackish. The brackish water tends to be places where fresh water mixes with salt water, like estuaries, for instance. Um, and then saline water tends to be between 10,000 and 100,000. So I'm just realizing I misspoke when I said 3.5% um, uh, and then 0.35% um, in 1,000 relative to um, the salt in seawater, which, right, so saline is somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000, and seawater with an average of 35. Uh, you know, for, uh, three point five percent for the salinity has thirty five thousand. It's right in the middle of that. And then we have stuff that we call brines, right? And brines have more than a hundred thousand. So we can find them like shallow tidal basins, geothermal water, those kinds of things. And you can see they're really, really salty. So if you take a step back and you look at this from a perspective of humans interacting with water, we need about two hundred parts per million which is, this is 1,000 parts per million, a milligram in a liter. Remember, in pure water, a liter weighs a kilogram. So um, one milligram in one kilogram is one part per million. 1,000 milligrams in one kilogram is 1,000 parts per million. Another way to think about 1,000 parts per million is to say it's a tenth of a percent. But you know we use these terms all the time, so I want you to be used to talking in PPMs and PPTs, which are parts per thousand. Percents are just parts per hundred PPAs. Um, so we consider 200, one fifth of this, a marginal drink of water. Even that, you would say, oh man, this water tastes kind of gnarly. I, I grew up in Southern California, and in San Diego, that's what the water was, and it tasted terrible. We always use bottled water. Wait, I have a question. Yep. What is Geothermal water, you know, like um, water that you find, uh, you know, heated up near um, a subterranean heat store. So, for instance, um, along the Kilauea East Rift Zone, groundwater infiltrates down to the rock and it heats up and it exchanges oh, and gets chemically reduced. The hydrothermal vents under the ocean, those kinds of things. Oh, I see. Okay. And so, like, for instance, if you're using them for geothermal heat production, they can be really salty. Yes, that's actually the main issue with using that water is by transporting around a bunch of really salty water. That's also that's not really bad. So this is another chart that comes from uh, the EPA, basically showing you just a tiny little corner of that upper diagram, right? So if we consider fresh, zero to 1,000 milligrams per liter or ppm. This is considered, this is less than half of that value. This is only zero up to 400. And you can see here that only the bottom part of this is considered suitable for uh, human use, right? Drinking water is like zero to 50. This kind of water up here, you know, would be, um, would be called hard water. Um, it might be acceptable for some things, like you know, mineral spring water or whatever. But you'd have to be hard pressed to use it in industrial processes. There's like so much stuff in it. You know, it's small compared to seawater that if you're running pipes, you know, through your uh, factory or whatever, you can start to salt out in your pipelines and stuff. And so it's useful to kind of get a quantity when we're talking about TDF. What we're talking about relative to a few things. And one of them is what we consider acceptable drinking water, right? And acceptable drinking water get a value of 50, right? Go back to the definition in PPMs of seawater as an average of 34,000 to 35,000. You can see how much less it is. A factor of 7,000 less salt. So now we're talking about TDS. We're going to talk about the next topic is solubility, OK? And what determines what is in solution, in what place, in a function of all the solids are around, how easily do they dissolve? Dissolve them super easy or are they hard? 
They can be any kind of solids. They could be rock, sediment particles, soil particles, tree bark, um, man-made solids. You name it. All of them are made of chemicals, and to some degree, lesser or more, they can dissolve. And so the chemistry of a substance determines a lot of that solubility. But we find in nature, also the shape of things matter, right? So if we have solids that um, interact with water, is that solid porous? Can water flow through it and interact with all the grain boundaries in there? The porosity part was really important. If it's, a, a, if it's a sediment or think about like the rocks here, if you look at any volcanic rocks, you'll see some, you know, some of them have a lot of pupas in the bubbles frozen in that are what we call vesicles. That when they're in the subsurface, water can flow through them more easily because of those bubbles than if they don't have. So um, the size, shape, and orientation of the grains in a rock and other imperfections in the rock will affect how fast they will dissolve and release chemicals in the water. So the extent of dissolution of a solid is covered not just by the chemistry, but also by the physics of the situation in the environment where we find those parts. Okay, so then after we present some solids or some water and it dissolves some stuff and stuff goes in the solution, the next question to ask is, okay, stuff just got dissolved by interacting with water, does it stay there? Does it want to stay solubilized in water or come back out? And this is where that ion potential discussion the last time comes in. The high and low ion potential elements on either side of the star, if they get released into water, they mostly stay there. I, I can give you some exceptions to the rule, but let's just say for the time being, uh, the higher IP ions will stay in solution. And the moderate intermediate IP ions, which is the ones in the center, they don't dissolve as much. So if we look at minerals, we say, oh, look at this mineral, it's got a bunch of iron in it. Well, iron happens to be one of these elements in the middle. It doesn't dissolve very well. It doesn't stay in solution. Its chemistry just doesn't like being in water. So when we weather, we for instance take the rock here in the Monroe Valley and we turn it into clay over millions of years. 1.6 million to be precise, um, then uh, we are liberating some stuff into the water. But some of that stuff is not staying in the water. Iron is a good example. That's why the soils are so iron rich, because it's just not very soluble in the water. The one thing that can change the intermediate IP ions is the presence of organic matter. So whether that organic matter is coming from waste, like you know, sewage stream, or it's coming naturally off the landscape, that will help enhance the chemistry of things. But for today's discussion, we're just going to assume that we got solids interacting with pure water and it doesn't have these stuff in it. So we can look at the kind of chemical effects. So it happens up three terms, uh, well, it's two terms. Solubility, which is just a measure, it's got a quantitative um, you know, aspect to it. It's the equilibrium quantity of a substance that can be dissolved in uh, a solution. That's just the broadest definition. When we're talking about aqueous solubility. We usually quantify it specifically as either the moles of solid substance that can dissolve in a liter of water or the grams of substance that can dissolve into a liter of water. Either way. It's like a so you just think about it right off the top of your back that something that dissolves a lot is going to have a lot of grams of that solid in water that has a high time load. Something that dissolves a little will have a small number of grams in water, so that gives you a low solid load. It's a related term called saturation. Saturation is reaching the state in solution where you put the maximum amount of that material in there and you can put in no more. It's saturated because it means that it's as full of that chemical as it can get. And um, there's no way to make it any fuller. And if you, for instance, have a saturated solution and you um, evaporate it a little bit, then solid will start to come back out. So that's important. And the concentration units are the ones that we've been talking about, both molarity, molality, and parts per million, you know, which when we're doing it by weight. 
that means milligrams per kilogram or micrograms per gram or whatever other unit you want to come up with. Okay, so that was another term that we use, which has to do with how does stuff dissolve. So mostly we are used to dealing with materials that dissolve in a congruent sense. Congruent dissolution means I throw some stuff into a solution. And I'm just going to keep using the example of solids, chemicals dissolving in water, but it could be anything. It could be any solvent you want. In a congruent case, as the chemical dissolves, it all dissolves. It doesn't leave any solid behind. And that is distinguished from something that dissolves incongruently or incongruent dissolution, where as a solid dissolves, it leaves behind a modified solid. Right? We'll see how this works in a second chemically. But where this is really common is in the alteration of silicate minerals that we find all around us in the landscape. So all the primary minerals in a basalt, for instance, that interact with water and weather the rock and make the minerals change color and um, basically transform the rock into clays and oxides, those clays and oxides are the stuff that's left behind when we dissolve minerals incongruently. And so another way to think about congruent and incongruent dissolution Congruent dissolution tends to be of solids that are formed of high solubility chemicals. As the stuff dissolves, everything likes to go into solution and stay in solution. Incongruent dissolution tends to be from materials where at least a significant portion of the solid is not soluble. So that as we start to interact it with water, the chemical dissolves, but it immediately reprecipitates as something else. And so the two most important chemicals that help determine whether or a chemical element, to help determine whether something dissolves this way or this way, are aluminum and silicon. Right? So you can see what they sit up here in the chart. Aluminum and silicon, they're really hard to dissolve. You can dissolve a little bit of them, but they're really hard to dissolve. So that in nature, when we take silicate minerals or aluminosilicate minerals, which are two of the fundamental primary types of minerals in most of the rocks that we find around us, and we interact them with water, they dissolve incongruently and leave the aluminum and silicon behind to not dissolve. We make new solids, we transform our solids, and what we've done is suck off all the other counter ions, the stuff like the calcium and the sodium and the magnesium, even the iron, the electro degrade. So does that distinction make sense or incongruent and incongruent? Okay. So here's just some simple examples of solubility, how it works, um, and the different categories that we have. So we can have, for instance, an ionic solid like sodium chloride. We stick it in water, it dissociates to make sodium ions and chloride ions. That's an ionic salt, right? And so these tend to um, dissolve congruently. The more, you know, if we if we can get a saturated solution where we can dissolve a little more salt into it, so then the salt just looks like the salt always looks like. And every increment of it that dissolves so this. We also have covalently bonded materials that solubilize but don't break apart. Glucose is a great example. You take a teaspoon of sugar in the morning and you stick it into your coffee or tea or whatever. Um, it dissolves into the water. You can't see the solid anymore. And you can reach saturated solution if you make like super sweet tea or something, but the solid that's left behind still just looks like the original solid, it just doesn't dissolve. You reach the saturated. Then we can also have covalently or ionically bonded materials that chemically react with the solution. Now, this is different than the congruent incongruent thing, it's an actual chemical reaction. So, one of the examples I think we've been talking about a lot CO2 dissolving into water to make aqueous CO2, which makes carbonic acid, which associates to these two things. There's an actual chemical reaction between this chemical and the water. And so this is a different category of solubility than congruent or incongruent. It doesn't have a term as far as I know, but it's another kind of chemical reaction. And finally, this one. So this magnesium silicate MgSiO3, that is the um, chemical form of a pyroxene mineral. 
Um, we can find kerosene metals that have calcium in there, uh, sodium, you know, different things, and pyrifines can form in, um, you know, clinopyrifines and orthopyrifines, not that matters from the chemistry perspective. When this solid interacts with water, it liberates the magnesium ion, it liberates some dissolved silica, and it liberates some hydroxide ion. Like, whoa, what's going on there? This chemical is interacting with this chemical, it's acting like a base, and it's sucking the hydrogen off of water and leaving behind hydroxide. And in fact, the dissolution, it's a slow process, but the dissolution of silicate minerals in the landscape tends to make the water more basic. And this is one of the reasons why if you think back to last time I showed you that chart of natural pH of water, I said, oh, rain is very acidic and of all that carbon dioxide. Since we get onto the landscape and start like, you know, interacting with soils and, and surface rocks and get stream water and groundwater and flows into the ocean, the pH keeps going up. And the reason the pH keeps going up is the liberation of hydroxide from all the weathering is going on with the silicate minerals in the crust. So that's a process that takes uh, low pH water or high acidity water and makes it high pH. And that's a chemical reaction. Now, regardless of the case, ionic salt, covalent material, or ionic and covalent materials that are interacting with water, we can still define solubility in all these cases. You just have to go back and remind yourself, what is the definition of solubility? Solubility is the number of material, you know, either in moles or gram units of a substance that dissolves in a known volume of water at a certain temperature, right? And so, for instance, when we look at this thing, we want to say, well, how much of this dissolves? We have one mole of this, and it all dissolves in water to make one mole of this, and one mole. If it doesn't dissolve, if it was a sparingly soluble salt, we might start with a mole here, we only get a tenth of a mole. So the solubility would be different for that different chemical. Same thing here. How much of this we have, the amount of it that dissolves, the saturation in water, either uh, in, in mole or gram, is the uh, solubility. Even for things like this, right, for this uh, chemical here, this um, ferritin mineral, if a mole of this dissolves, it makes a mole of magnesium. Like they go in a solution. And this other stuff is complicated. This stuff is not very soluble. It's going to come back out in different forms of silicon. But this one is pretty soluble. And so it's pretty easy to define the solubility on this by just tracking this. So is the one with silicon congruent? This is a congruent dissolution because as this happens, it doesn't leave behind the salt. Mm -hmm. I'll show you an incongruent example with silicon coming up where another silicate will make a clay metal. Is it because the silicate with the oxygen or why is that so good? Yeah, well, because at least the way this is written out, this is dissolved in water. Mm -hmm. If that were a solid, then it would be incongruent, it would be a new kind of salt. And so th this kind of reaction is like a little bit, um, it depends on how much we let it go. It's really easy to read saturation of this thing and then it becomes incongruent. So I don't know why I have an empty slide there, but I have an empty slide. Okay, so let's just look at solubility now for a couple of these cases. So let's look at that very first one, the sodium chloride. Right? So we can write an equilibrium constant for dissolution, K, sometimes abbreviated KSP, SP stands for solubility product. Remember, following our rules for in aqueous situations, we don't put in solids. So the equilibrium constant is the product over the reactants, but the reactants to the solids, so we give it a value of one. Thus, the formulation of the equilibrium constant, which is just the product of the activities of the two parts of the salt that are dissolved. So you can basically see based on a stoichiometry that says if a mole of this dissolves, it makes a mole of that, a mole of that, these two things have to be equal. If the only thing that's dissolving is putting chloride in solution, we have to get an equal number of sodium ions and chloride ions in solution when that happens. So if we set them both to x, we substitute them into this equation, we get an equation that says the solubility product equals x squared. If X is the number of moles of solid that dissolves into a liter at whatever conditions we want, then we can define solubility as X, which is just the square root of this. We're just doing a little bit of algebra for that. 
So I've set up X as the moles of the chemical that dissolves. It's the same for both of these ions because it's stoichiometry. This is an equilibrium constant. We look up in a book, so this is a simple measure of the solubility. Okay, and that's just a picture of what daylight um, sodium chloride looks like. Now let's go to a slightly more complicated case. Let's look at fluoride. Fluoride is another metal, calcium fluorine two. Okay, there's two fluorine. So the stoichiometry is a little bit different. When we dissolve this stuff, we get one mole of calcium and two moles of fluoride. So if we want to say solubility, which is X, the number of moles of a chemical that dissolves, if we set calcium as X, right? One mole of this dissolves to make a mole of that, then we're going to get two moles of that, right? So if this is X, this is two X. We can write out our equilibrium constant, okay? And so the equilibrium constant is slightly different. The activity of calcium and the activity of fluoride squared, right? Remember how the stoichiometric coefficients work? This one here goes in as a squared. So now if we put x and 2x into this thing, we come up with a more complicated expression. But x is the cube root of the solubility product divided by 4. All right? Again, it's just a mathematical expression, but we picked the easiest thing we could, the thing that's a one to one stoichiometry in solution relative to the original solid to track our solubility. We could have come up with the same exact answer if we made it harder on ourselves. We said, oh, one mole of that makes two moles of that, and then call that X, and we call this 0.5 X, and blah, blah, blah. We would still come up with the same answer. Some number that we look up in a book and, um, you know, a little bit of mathematics, but we can still define the solubility. That's the key point. And I'm going to use these equations in a second on a diagram where we compare a bunch of minerals. That's why we're, we're writing these out. So we have something like that covalently bonding case, the glucose, they're a lot simpler. So there's no kind of breaking apart chemicals. So solubility is just the equilibrium constant for dissolution is just K equals the concentration of the aqueous solid, uh, solid solute that's been dissolved. And the solid doesn't go in here. So X is just K. It would you know, be a really simple situation. So now let's look at that magnesium silicate example that we're just talking about. I've shown you a picture of a mineral uh, encetite, which is an end mineral pyroxene composition in the ortho pyroxene series. When that dissolves in water, it can be written out two slightly different ways, the way I gave it to you before. Okay. And the way that white likes to write it out in the textbook, where magnesium silicate is reacting with three water molecules, instead of making aqueous SiO2, making silicious acid H4SiO4. Okay, so the different forms of the chemical affect how the equation looks, but it doesn't affect the basics of the chemistry of the equation, which are that. In either case, a mole of solid dissolves in water and it makes a mole of magnesium ion, a mole of dissolved silicon, and two hydroxide ions. You guys see that? that it's the distinction between this and this requires there to be something happening here to kind of balance out different numbers of water molecules. We don't put water molecules are equilibrium constant. So, either way, if we look at equilibrium constant for this, it would be exactly the same. It would be, you know, the activity of hydroxide squared, the activity of dissolved silica, and the activity of magnesium ion. The water doesn't go in, and the solid doesn't go in. So I can, you know, write my equilibrium constant out in this right here. Either way. And so again, looking at the solubility and saying, well, if a bowl of anthracite dissolves in water, it's going to make a bowl of magnesium, and set that to X, and we set this to X, and we set this to 2X. Substitute it in, blah, 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 and they come up with a slightly different expression where the x is just the equilibrium constant divided by four to the uh, you know, one quarter root of the uh, one quarter power. And again, this math isn't super important other than to say that to illustrate that we can always find an expression for solubility for any mineral. So now we finally get to the incongruent example that uh, you are asking about. This is a feldspar now, potassium feldspar. 
turns out that um, especially the alumina silicate mineral, um, so um, you know, there's a lot of different minerals in that category, but the feldspar are one of the most common ones. They dissolve incongruently. When they dissolve in water, they again they act as a base, they absorb a little hydrogen ion, and they release a new chemical solid, a clay mineral. This is mineral kaolinite. Plus some potassium ions, plus the dissolved silicon. So this is an example of an incongruent dissolution because basically the aluminum and the silicon, at least some fraction of it, never really dissolves. They just transform from one mineral into another. And we can actually go out, you know, into the field and find rock where we have this transformation having happened. You still find feldspar, but then you have an annulus around the most clean mineral. Okay, some fraction of the silicon is dissolved, but some fraction or all of the potassium of the mineral that dissolves. Dissolved, but it made a new solid. But we can still define solubility as every mole of this feldspar mineral makes a mole of potassium. You can see in the stoichiometry here, it's two of these makes two of these. So if we define solubility X as the number of moles of this material that will dissolve, it will make an equivalent X amount of potassium. Okay. And so you can write out an equilibrium expression for this, right? This is a solid. This is a solid. This is water doesn't go in this. The equilibrium constant is going to be the activity of potassium squared, the activity of silica to the fourth, divided by the activity of hydrogen ion squared. Uh -huh. um, why would we choose potassium to find our solubility? You can choose whatever you want. I just pick the easiest thing because one mole of this makes one mole of that. So you, if you wanted to use um, the silicon, you could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you do that and you stick stuff into the equation, right? You also have to recognize that the number of moles of this that make this, you get twice as many moles of that. Right? Just that's just a stoichiometry of it. So. Um, X is the concentration of potassium, it's half the concentration of silicon, and it's also the concentration of hydrogen. So we can substitute all those things in to our equilibrium constant expression and come up with a even more complicated expression, which I haven't bothered to write it out here, but but we can always still track stuff if we just look at the solid that's formed. And if there's no single chemical on the product side that's in an equal um stoichiometric proportion to the solid, then we just have to account for that stoichiometry difference. Okay, so um, we can define the solubility in another way, which is to go back here and say, well, what is the ratio of this to this? This solid to that solid. Now that is more difficult to do in nature because solids, especially of different grain sizes and characteristics can be separated from each other by through flowing water, for instance which means that it would upset the balance between these two things. But in theory, and this is something that people have done by looking at the paleo deposits in the past where the water is gone, but the solids are still there, we look at the ratio of things and to also try and say how much of a reaction happened or how soluble was something in that environment. So this is basically that incongruent reaction. This is um, a potassium feldspar mineral um, orthoclase dissolving to make kaolinite. That's kind of what kaolinite looks like. And um, in this incongruent reaction, again, you know, as we've been talking about, one mole of this stuff dissolves and it makes, liberates a mole of potassium ion. And so we can write out the equilibrium constant for that time. That's the situation. So there's one final thing. Does everyone remember this sort of thing, the common ion effect from when you took chemistry? And like, let's say you have two chemicals that both have, when they dissociate in water, they both produce the same ion. So in this case, sodium chloride and calcium chloride, they have a common ion. And so when we dissolve both of those things together in solution, they, in a cross chemical sense, affect each other's solubility, right? Like, let's say it turns out that sodium chloride is much more soluble than calcium chloride. So we can put less calcium chloride into a solution that already has sodium chloride in it than into a solution that was pure water. 
because we reach the saturation product for calcium chloride sooner because we've already got some fluoride ions from sodium chloride and this is what we call the common ion effect and this is you know there's usually um you know you can go back and review some chemistry problems where they basically you just give given a couple of equilibrium constants and you calculate the amount of a salt that you can dissolve in water when it's pure water versus the amount that you can dissolve when something else with a common ion is already in solution you see that it's, it's always less you can always put less of the less soluble of two chemicals in a group in solution if it shares an ion with one of the other things that's already in solution. Okay, so now the rest of the time we're just going to talk about mineral stability diagrams. So think about this chemical reactor we just talked about. Fourth place going to scale limit, like that incongruent system. I've written out the equilibrium constant expression here, right? It's the activity of dissolved silica to the fourth power, the activity of potassium ions to the second power, right? Both of those two things. Divided by the activity of hydrogen ions in second power. Solids don't go in. Water doesn't go in. So now I'm going to do some fancy math, like I like to do. I take a logarithm of both sides. Okay. So then I get a new a thing called the log of K, right? And the reason we use logarithms is because uh, when we're using logs, we pull the exponents out in front of the expression, right? So the log. Of H4SiO4 to the fourth is just four times the log of H4SiO4. Also, when we take the log of things that are multiplied by each other, that we can separate them out with the plus sign. So now I've got an expression, which is the logarithm of the equilibrium product. It's something we look up in the book. It's four times the log of the concentration of the salt silica plus two times the log of the ratio of potassium ions over hydrogen. So this is just an equation of a line, right? Where y equals mx plus e, basically. Okay. And so and I, which I've written out here, okay, we can rearrange this equation if we want to, because this is a constant, so this is actually our e. Um, so that we can on a diagram where we plot up the variation of silicon versus this ratio. That's what becomes a lot. Um, and so we can look at conditions where the amount of our mineral will dissolve in a natural water differently as a function of the relative proportions of already existing dissolved silicon, the pH, and the amount of um, already present potassium. And that's what this looks like a lot. This is a plot of the log of H4SiO4. And this is the log of potassium over hydrogen, right? And the location of this line is defined by the equilibrium constant, basically. And the slope of this line, right? If we rearrange, so I'll take this written up here. Right? So if, you know, we take that equation and we rearrange it into a form of a y equals mx plus b, then that what determines you know how steep or shallow that line is comes from that stoichiometric coefficient. Here, right, the combination of this plus this. Basically, what we're going to do is put this thing on this side of the equation, put this thing on that side of the equation, and divide through by four and um, come up with a simple one. So, I hope you can see where I'm going. We can make a line like this for every single mineral in an environment. And we can say, oh, okay, let's take all the minerals that contribute potassium to the environment. And let's make a diagram like this for a whole bunch of lines on it. So we can go look at a rock, for instance, and we say, oh, well, does that have a bunch of this? Or does that have a bunch of that? Or does that have both? And just like in other um, phase diagram sections, we can say what conditions we were at in the water that made those rocks on the basis of the activities of these simple things. Okay? And um, those are called solubility diagrams. So it's that same exact diagram again. That's the line. So the solubility of uh, potassium feldspar and the relative to kaolinite. But if added in another line, well, the textbook added in another line, which is the solubility of amorphous silicon. 
So it turns out if this chemical reaction is progressing, right, then some amount of the silicon that's in solution reaches saturation and coming back out as um, inorganic um, silica that can precipitate on surfaces. Um, but the point being is that along this axis, another kind of chemistry kicks in where if this concentration gets too high, we precipitate at a different mineral. And that's when this reaction can go in conjure. If we reach a high enough concentration of silicon. And whether that happens depends on what else is happening in the water. If we're just putting feldspar in the water, then we can dissolve a lot more of it than if we're dissolving feldspar in the water that's also dissolved a bunch of other silicate minerals because it's already got some silica in it, then we make less of it. And as it continues to dissolve, we reach a maximum point. So these parts of these lines are dashed. They're dashed because they don't exist in nature because some other chemical reaction takes over for them. So now we get a field on this diagram which tells us where we predict kaolinite by itself. Once we cross over this line, we get kaolinite and amorphous silica because it's reached its saturation. Right? And just remember, these are log concentrations in negative units. So, you know, this is much lower concentration than this one. These are factors of 10. This is 100 times less, or excuse me, 10 times less than this. That's 100 times less. That's 1,000 times. The solubility is not as affected by the pH and the potassium concentration, but there is a threshold where if that value gets high enough, then kaolinite won't dissolve and the potassium cells start to be So the water gets saturated with potassium. And so we can look at the fluid trajectory of any um, you know, water running through a solid and understand how its composition evolves as a function of these kinds of diagrams and the minerals that we think are were formed or, um, or are present. <clears throat> so this is that same exact diagram. Extended out now more units. And so we've still got the log of the silicon. Uh, there's also some both there and the log of the potassium of the hydrogen. And then some fields and so some additional minerals on there. So in addition to kaolinite, Right, which is that aluminum silicate mineral. This one here. And also, if we really crank on something, we can make something called gibsite. Gibsite is an aluminum hydroxide without silicon. Okay, it required really low concentrations of silicon in solution to kind of drive us to that. But that's the difference between. Down here at the bottom, below, this is still that same diagonal line separating kaolinite, kaolinite from potassium sulfur. But in this sense, if we keep going down here for really low silicon concentration, we can even dissolve our kaolinite and make it into something called geoxide, which is a little nice. Okay, so um, you can see the, uh, they, there's also another field on here for potassium and mica. These are some different waters <clears throat> formed in different environments. And where they sit on this diagram. And so one might be tempted to say, ah, oh, well, for instance, it looks like somehow this chemistry, you know, in the oceans is following along this line here between kaolinite and mica. It's more complicated than that. That isn't exactly what's cited in chemistry, but it gives us an indication, you know, that for instance, these kinds of uh, deep groundwaters and uh, surface waters in the Northeast. Are primarily these could be ions, the silicon, potassium, and hydrogen, being affected by this transformation between gibsite and kaolin because they sit astride of the field. So this is another example, way more complicated. It's the last thing I'm going to show you. This is the same diagram, but for magnesium silicon. So the last diagram was for potassium silicon. Okay. And I would just say focus on this down here. Have that same exact thing the log of the dissolved silica. Now over here we got the log of magnesium over hydrogen instead of the log of potassium over hydrogen. But otherwise, this comes from taking a whole, whole bunch of expressions for solubility, which are given here. You know, you'll have to read through this at your leisure. Um, but this is a whole bunch of different chemical reactions involving silicate minerals that have magnesium in them, dissolving into water. They're equilibrium constants and writing out expressions that are all written in the same form 
where the log of the magnesium over hydrogen ion concentration equals something. And that something is an expression of with silica and then some toxin, which comes from the minus log of the equilibrium constant. Every single one of these things is a line. And those lines are all these lines. And what we get is a little box down here in the lower right where natural solutions fit in here. Based on the maximum solubility of silicon, this is that same exact amorphous silica line that we had over here on this diagram, this thing here, same exact line. <clears throat> There's just way more minerals that contain magnesium. And so there's a maximum concentration of magnesium over hydrogen ions that can be in solution at low silica, so down over here, it's set by a mineral called magnesite. <clears throat> Once we get up to higher concentration of silica, if we started to increase this ratio, so move up in this side, we intersect a different line. We intersect a line with surface. If we go a little bit farther over, we're going to intersect a line for sapiolite. Now, you don't have to memorize these names, they're not important, but you can find all those things on here, right? There are certain things that surface the equation. And we can find the magnesite equation on here somewhere. Now, <clears throat> that's interesting. Magnesite is not, he doesn't, he doesn't list that one equation on here. But in any event, all those other minerals, so like, uh, Forsterite, right, which is uh, magnesium rich olive, and it's got replaced. What's interesting about that one is that it doesn't intersect the water stability field. It's all the way up here. It is not stable in the presence of water in any uh, concentration because it doesn't intersect the field of natural solutions that exist at low activity. So, another way of thinking about that is to say if we have Forsterite in the presence of water is going to dissolve. It was all incongruently. It may be really slow, right? That's chemical kinetics. But any one of these minerals whose line on this diagram doesn't intersect this water stability field is not stable in the presence of water. Does that make sense? So we can learn a lot about minerals because of that. Now, this exact diagram could be redrawn for conditions that, might, that we might find a kilometer down here in the crust. Right, with elevated temperature and elevated pressure. When the lines move around, the solubility fields move around. So we have to be really careful to not take a one atmosphere pressure 25 degrees C situation and apply the depth. We have to recalculate all these things, which I think we can do. Um, but nevertheless, this gives us a framework for how we understand the evolution of natural water as a function of the solid So um, fortunately, we living in the modern world, we have computer programs that can solve this stuff for us. Right? There are programs that will look at the mineral stabilities of every mineral possible, and you can give it a natural water and it'll calculate. And it doesn't actually make these diagrams, it just calculates the lines for every little thing, and it can tell you what minerals it thinks uh, we're likely to be saturated from this solution. And as I say, it's, um, it's a common tool used, um, for instance, in, in hydrologic sciences and water quality and that kind of stuff. So that was the last slide. I'm going to end there. Ask you if you have questions. <clears throat>